and welcome to the 14th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2019. Uh, we have received apologies this morning from Sandra White and from David Stewart. Anna Sauer is attending uh, as a substitute member uh, today. Welcome. Can I ask everyone in the room please ensure that mobile phones are off or on silent? The first item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation and consideration of a negative instrument, the National Health Service Free Prescriptions and Charges for Drugs and Appliances Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered the instrument at its meeting on the 7th of May and determined that it did not need to draw attention of the Parliament to this instrument on any grounds within its remit. Can I ask if any members have any comments they wish to make on this instrument? If not, is the committee agreed to make no recommendations? Agreed. Thank you very much. Uh, move on to agenda item two, which is pre-budget scrutiny for 2020-2021, uh, which is an evidence session with chief officers and chief finance officers uh, from three integrated joint boards. The committee agreed to undertake pre-budget scrutiny for 2020-2021, building on the approach taken in previous years with scrutiny of the integration process and that will be the focus of today's meeting. So can I welcome to the committee and in some cases welcome again to the committee uh, Judith Proctor, Chief Officer and Moira Pringle, Chief Finance Officer from Edinburgh IJB, uh, Val de Souza, Chief Officer and Mary Moy, Chief Finance Officer from South Lanarkshire and Eddie Fraser and Craig MacArthur, uh, Chief Officer and Chief Finance Officer from East Ayrshire uh, IJB. Welcome uh, this morning and Thank you very much for your attendance. Can I start off uh, with a general question on um, the, the budget process? One of the things the committee has had a focus upon is trying to understand the budget setting processes in IJBs and how far they are achieving the same uh, level and standards uh, and, and indeed the same timetable. And so can I ask, first of all, in, for, for each of the... IGBs, whether you did indeed uh, agree your budget by the beginning of the current financial year for this financial year. Who would like to start? And, and, and also any issues that may have arisen. Eddie Fraser. Thank you, Kavira. Uh, yes, I'm pleased to say in East Asia we were able to set our budget on the, the, the 28th of, of March, you know, like this year, and that followed, you know, the Council setting their budget in February, and actually the Health Board were able to set their budget on the, the, the 27th, you know, like, uh, of March. So, so this year, which has been different from previous years, we were able to do that. Because it was set at the very end of the financial year, there were still some of our, you know, like balances in terms of how we were going to bring the budget into balance, you know, in terms of some of our efficiencies that we still had to work through and then take back to a future committee of the integration joint board. But we were able to set the budget this year. Thank you very much. Uh, well. Yes, thank you, convener. Yes, um, likewise, um, delighted to say that we were able to set the budget this year. Um, and again, that was with um, uh, quite a bit of support from our partners on both the NHS and the local authority side. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Judith Proctor. A different position in Edinburgh. Uh, we agreed the settlement to the IGB from both partners, and we have worked through a, a process within the IGB of agreeing the budget savings and efficiencies and transformation that we need within the partnership as yet. We haven't identified a balanced budget, um, but we're working very positively with our partners and anticipate being able to do so within this financial year. And, and so is it your expectation then, looking forward, that Edinburgh in future will seek to be in the same position as the other uh, IGBs? Most definitely. We morning. want to be in a position where, going into each financial year, we're able to set a, a clear budget for the, the partnership. Thank, thank you very much. Eddie Fraser mentioned that this was a, 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 a change from previous years, and clearly uh, it, it's work in progress across, across the country. And, and I think you also mentioned that the Health Board for Ayrshire and Arran met to set its budget the day before uh, you did the same in, in, in East Ayrshire. In the past, we found that the differing timeframes of local authority budget setting, Health Board budget setting, have had an impact on the ability of IGBs to plan ahead. Is that still the case, or is that something that is changing? Judith Proctor. 
if, if, if I could uh, address that one, um, we've tried in Edinburgh, and I think all partners recognise some of the challenges in those those parallel different budget setting processes. And I think there's certainly been a um, very good attempts to try and align that as, as far as is possible, uh, and to, to do that in a way that, that gives sufficient time for scrutiny and, and decisions and transparency around the budget. So I think while it's difficult, there's certainly been, in my experience in, in Edinburgh with our, our partners, a, a willingness to uh, recognise the, the different different processes and timelines in that and to try as far as possible align them. Thank you very much. Eddie Fraser. I suppose it's also to, to remember actually at that time of setting the budget at IGIB, the role of the Chief Officer and the Chief Finance of Officer. It's for us to give advice to the Integration Joint Board that the finances are sufficient to deliver against the strategic plan. That's actually part of the legislation, what we're actually saying there. So, so if you don't have a surety around the finances, you know, you can't actually say that, you know, that statement against the strategic plan. You know, so because sometimes the question might be, do you need to go and, you know, amend your strategic plan to bring it in line with, uh, you know, the finances available? And that's why the balance of the two things being brought together at the same time is just so essential for us. OK, thank you very much. I'll call Hamilton. Good morning to the panel. Um, naturally, as an MSP for Edinburgh, I'd, I'd like to start by directing questions to Judith Proctor and Maura Pringle. Welcome to the committee. It's good to see you again. Um, just firstly, on the projected overspend of 2%, um, you said in your opening remarks that you've yet to find the savings necessary to balance the budget. It's not, I mean, this has been coming for a while, and I'm just a bit concerned that whilst I absolutely believe your intent to get to a balanced budget, if you've not found the savings now, how do you expect to find them in the future? Um, we've identified a, a very solid savings programme within the partnership, and we are talking um, about our savings in the same way as we're talking about the wider transformation that we need to put in place in Edinburgh, and it's over sort of three horizons, and I think we need to recognise a slightly longer time frame uh, in terms of how we get to being a, a truly sustainable partnership, you know, really delivering um, better outcomes for, for, for people in the city. And we talk a lot about the, the grip and control that we want to, to achieve, and we set that out in our submission, the service redesign that we require, but also that long longer term transformation that the, that the board is, is keen to invest in. So the savings that we've identified, we believe that we can deliver in year. And again, we've been really uh, quite clear and focused as, as, a, as a partnership, as advisors to the board and the board itself, that you know, we want to, to achieve that without any diminution in the um, outcome improvements that we're beginning to see in Edinburgh. We really want to, to continue to focus on that improvement. We want to ensure that people have a good experience of our services, but we also want to get to balance. So the approach that we're taking is very much one of of, of partnership uh, with NHS Lothian, with City of Edinburgh Council. How do we work together as three partners? Because again, that's as set out in the legislation to identify things that we can do collectively and proactively uh, to, to achieve balance in the year. And that may well include discussions that we have around the set aside, how we handle that uh, ac across the year and what our partners might do with us to help us uh, achieve a balanced position in, in the year. Um, uh, uh, Again, would reiterate, you know, we're very, very keen that we do that in a proactive way. We don't want to get to the end of the year um, and, and find that we've not done that. So we're, we're already in, in year um, working with our partners on, on those uh, approaches and discussions. Well, the, the partnership approach is certainly gratifying to hear, and I, I wish you well with it. It strikes me, though, that you've got two mutually exclusive goals in this. On the one hand, as we all know, Miles and I both represent um, Edinburgh constituencies, that, um, that Edinburgh really faces a real problem, particularly around delayed discharge. The social care environment is not geared up for the massive pressures it's experiencing, both from hospital exit, but also the ageing population. Um, so we're actually asking you to do far more but you're talking about reducing your spend. So I don't understand how we square that circle. If we're going to properly tackle delayed discharge in particular, we absolutely need to um, bolster the social care provision in the city. It strikes me that r trying to reduce your spend is not compatible with that aim. Um, I think it's about how we... Sorry. You, Chair. Um, I think it's how we how we work and, and how we operate as a partnership. And of course, another key element of health and social care integration is about that wider transformation, working differently, working differently and with communities, supporting people towards independence and, and rehabilitation. And I think it's important also in the context in Edinburgh in particular to recognise that we, we have achieved some, some real improvements in the decisions that the board made to invest further in social care. So we have actually taken budget and invested more in social care. 
and through that we've seen a 48% reduction in delayed discharges in, in, in Edinburgh over the past year, and with that a 66% reduction in bed days lost in NHS Lothian, again as a result of the work that we've done. We've seen improvements in the number of people waiting for an assessment, and actually improvements in the time people are waiting for care from us. So I think there's been a, quite a, a, a good um, trajectory between board decisions about how it uses its budget and where the priorities are, such as in social care, directing budget there and actually seeing improvement. And, and that's the kind of discussion that we're having about the whole system and how we work as a whole system to focus both on the transformation and the, 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 the outcome improvement that we want to continue to drive forward in Edinburgh. Final question to Edim our Edinburgh colleagues, if I may, Convener. Um, you talked about three horizons of change. Um, can you give us a, a sort of broad timescale for those three horizons? At, at, at which point, for example, if we have you in next year, will we be in a balanced budget position? Um, I, I, th I think we, we, we talk about a three to five year, you know, longer term horizon, you know, with, with the, the medium term being sort of two to three years with, within that. Um, we are working very positively and the, the conversations that we're having with City of Edinburgh Council and with uh, Lothian Health Board are that next year we want to be going into the next financial year having identified as a partnership um, a, a, a balanced budget and being able to do that each year after. Okay. And just widen any of those questions or comments up to the rest of the panel if there's anything you'd like to come in from your own position mr fraser i suppose it's just that discussion around you know being able to have positive impact whilst improving you know the service to, to, to our populations uh, we're lucky enough to be in a position where our people are on very well in relation to to hospital discharge and transferring people to care in the uh, the, the community and um, the result of that can be savings in the social care budget. You know, people staying too long in hospital is very debilitating. Therefore, when they actually do come out of hospital, they need higher cost social care packages, often care homes. So actually by us working really hard and actually people coming out of hospital timidly, you know, we've actually reduced the number of people in care homes by 10% over the last 18 months. So actually we're able to redirect some of that money back towards care at home. And actually, so the, the positive performance, you know, in terms of people transferring out of hospital, the positive impacts for the, you know, older people in particular is actually costs us less money. And actually, so some of that is it's a positive cycle that we try and work our way into. You need to be able to release the money out of some services, in this instance, care home services, to be able to invest in other services. And that's a really positive position we have reached. Thank you very much. Um, well, this is um, thank you, um, convener. Um, yeah, just to, to build and to add on what my colleagues are saying, I, I guess the the um, the challenge that we have is working in an environment where we have um, an increase in demand, um, and and I guess um, it's the increase in complexity as well as people live longer with more conditions. Um, so I think that challenges a little bit more than we speak about um, from time to time. That's costly but also it's complex in terms of design and how we um, deliver these services. But, but like my two colleagues, I think the challenge for us is around transformation, not just review and redesign, it has to be bigger. Um, and I think we're up to that challenge, um, but I think um, some of the time what we do need is some maybe bigger messages um, nationally to try to bring the public along with us in terms of what is required to take next steps and just the very difficult um, uh, topic of change and people don't like change generally. So to how do we as chief officers and how do we as partnerships manage to demonstrate that change is good in the way that Eddie demonstrates um, and the, the movement from residential care, releasing some resource and then being able to reinvest. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Murray. I actually want to pick up on your observation about um, the level of savings that are being um, requested across the partnership and the um, circumstances and conditions that we do find ourselves in, but particularly with demographic growth, the increasing uh, number of attendances at A&E and um, uh, other uh, significant financial pressures and operational demands that are being faced by the partners and the IGIB. And if there was an opportunity in the budget for 2021, then additional financial investment um, would be uh, welcomed because it would allow us to invest in the services 
further to the already investments that we do have across primary care and mental health, but particularly across social care services where demographic growth is increasing. We within South Lanarkshire have been relying on our council colleagues and our NHS colleagues to give us a financial envelope to allow the integration agenda to develop and to grow and to give us a chance to implement transformational change. But it is taking time and a critical area is early intervention and prevention. And it's very difficult to, on top of the savings, dealing with dem demographic growth, to also find recurring funding solutions to invest in reliable services that people can place confidence on in. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Miles Briggs. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, I've heard the word transformational from everybody uh, this morning, and you know we all support that direction of travel, but I look back to um, the movement towards care in the community in the 90s, which obviously very much saw front-loading of funding and almost two systems running side by side to achieve that. Um, in your opinion, do you think we haven't done that in the sense of the IJBs, that we've just expected to transform services but with the same money? That's a hard question. Judith Proctor. We've identified as a, an IGB just precisely that, that, that challenge and the, the balancing of managing business as usual, managing some of the performance issues, managing to, to, to try and get to a sustainable uh, budget position with the need to invest in, in change. We need to, to free up staff. We need to work differently with communities. Sometimes we need to invest in those communities, third sector organisations, and, and, and build in time so that the sort of transition from traditional and institutional models that Eddie described can, 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 can work through. So our, our board has, has agreed at a transformational fund uh, from within its budgets to do that. Um, and to help us achieve that over the, the three horizons. So I think it really, really is. It's, it's necessary to identify that, that funding. There are times when there will be double running costs that we would identify. And just to say that, 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 that time and space to carve out different ways of working with, with our partners to achieve the, the transformation that we need to see. Eddie Fraser. I think it's a, a really important area because I think this is about how we transfer care. And I think our clinicians are only willing to do that if they see safe alternative models of care. So if a GP is not going to refer someone to the hospital, there has to be an alternative to that that they feel is safe. So we need to build these safe alternative models of care first to be able to actually change, you know, what we're doing. So, you know, like Judith, we have, you know, a local transformation fund that actually has been funded by the council. So the council gave us money to actually uh, do that. And clearly we've also got significant funds coming to us over the next three years in terms of primary care. And although that primarily is about the sustainability of primary care, it will also have a massive impact on the wider, you know, like services that, that, that we uh, deliver. And similarly, the investment from mental health is welcome. But the fact that we need to actually build the alternatives first to give people the confidence, first of all, not to admit people to hospital, and secondly, for our hospital clinicians to transfer care back out is absolutely self-evident, and that is what we're having to do and trying to put together different resources and able to do that. Can I ask, is that transformation fund you identified as fund funded by the Council, is that part of the Council's allocation, in, in a standard allocation, or is it additional to that? It was an additional million pounds allocation they gave us for that. Okay. Thank you in terms of service redesign, then, and where you're looking to re, you know, redirect this money into <coughs> services, what sort of assessment do you do of impact around that? Because I know here in Edinburgh, as Alex has mentioned, we've seen um, debate around um, cuts to community services, for example, like the Pilton Community Health Project. And so in terms of um, direction which the IAs take from Scottish Government ministers on this, is that patchy or is that something you have true autonomy over? So I know members of IJBs who tell me that often things are put to them. It's not autonomous in terms of what they want to actually achieve. So the discussions which you then have with Scottish Government, for example, there was a piece of advice that £2.3 million could be taken out of drug and alcohol services here in Edinburgh to try to narrow that gap in finance. Where do you really act upon that when you're making these decisions around where these transformation or redesign or cuts will come from? Judith Proctor. 
I'm not entirely sure I follow the question. I wonder if you could reframe that one for me. Well, when you're looking at um, a service redesign, which often will feel like you're robbing Peter to pay Paul um, just to get the money to do that, um, where's that advice really checked to, to benchmark it and look towards an impact ass assessment that we're not going to just displace people and there's not going to be unintended consequences in other parts of our health service? Um, Chair. Um, so ultimately, the decisions in terms of the the, the allocation of the, of the budget uh, to deliver the strategic plan uh, sits between all, all partners uh, with the IGB uh, setting setting that direction. I think you're referring to particular funding streams that come in to, to the Health Board and to the Council from Scottish Government for specific outcomes to be delivered. Um, we would try, I'm sure all partnerships all partnerships would be in the same position to be doing that in partnership and to really understand you know, the, the, the system-wide delivery that the, the, the board has to agree. So yes, we would look at the indivi individual outcomes that we're seeking to achieve through uh, separate funding streams. That's really, really important. But also when you look at the breadth of what uh, an integration joint board is responsible for, we have to look at delivery right the way across that. Um, and it's really, really important in doing that that we look at the the, the, the overall outcomes that we're trying to achieve, the, 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 the national outcome measures, the MSG uh, 6, and to try and balance the, the, the delivery of particular specific outcomes in one part of the system and understand any opportunity cost or negative impacts on the other through, through doing that. So that becomes part of the, the conversation that we have within an IGB. It becomes part of the conversation that we have with all our partners and it becomes part of the conversation that we have you know, with colleagues in, in Scottish Government as well. Well, and just to add, you know, we, we would be and do impact assessments on on these decisions to help guide the board in its decision making. Uh, and I think the, you know, speaking about our, our own board, they're 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 very very well aware of the complexities of that decision making right the way across what is a, a very large budget and a, a very broad uh, and complex range of services and accountabilities and responsibilities that they have. I'll just do that. Um, thank you. Um, I, I want to respond to the question in terms of, I, I think you're talking about impact and evaluation. Um, with any um, service change, uh, uh, our, our approach, my approach, and I think my colleagues will be the same, will be about looking at data. It will be looking at policy and it will be looking at engaging with um, stakeholders. So those three elements have to be very powerful for you in order to go take forward a uh, 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 it's redesign or it could be something that would be transformational but redesign. So I'll give you an example in relation to care facilities or the care homes um, modernisation in South Lanarkshire. We based our um, thoughts and our proposal around this around um, a pilot that we did or a test of change around intermediate care. So basically we tried for um, almost a year to see what an intermediate care model would look like. So basically, whether it was step up, avoiding people going into a hospital, or step down, avoiding people or helping people to come out. So getting people back on their feet and home. Um, so that pilot showed that we had 56% 50, of the individuals going through that program um, could get back on their feet and go home. So we then designed um, a program of modernising care facilities around that kind of data. Um, and when we get to implement that fully, we will um, be mindful of both the data, the engagement and the policy the whole way through that process, and we'll be evaluating it as we go. You know, in that case, I welcome, but I think one of the areas we've seen across Scotland is actually with drug and alcohol partnerships. So in terms of their services, um, there's a pattern of actually their budgets being raided. Um, have any of your um, IJBs taken drug and alcohol partnership funding away then in the last year? Eddie Fraser. Um, <coughs> no, no, we haven't you know, taking money out of the drug and alcohol partnership. As you know, a number of years ago, how the money was allocated to, you know, to through health boards to alcohol and drug partnerships was partly from justice and partly from health. And actually that was aligned, actually, so as it all came, you know, through, through health. At that time, if, you know, it looked at that was a reduction 
in the totality coming for that, but then that became part of the overall sum that went from health to the IGIB for the IGIB to decide how money was spent. So we did not reduce, you know, like our funding to, you know, the, the alcohol and drug partnership. And clearly that was based on what Val and Judith have been saying. It's a strategic priority for us. You know, the level of, you know, like alcohol and drug misuse in East Ayrshire and across Ayrshire is high. So we would not, you know, like, uh, reduce that, you know, and, you know, that proved sound when we done that, you know, a couple of years ago, because in the following budget, we got a significant increase again in terms of the alcohol, you know, the allocation, and therefore we were able to make the sure that was a sustainable delivery, you know, to what, what we were doing there. But the, the general picture is that, you know, like we need to interpret at an IGIB level the totality of the funding that we have in order to make sure it fits with the priorities of our strategic plan. So the, the package of funding will come with a, a number of priorities to it, and we clearly will take into account the national priorities, health board priorities, council priorities, and mix all that together in the integration joint board to actually what we commission then as, as the services to meet our local communities. Okay, look, uh, Anna Sauer. There's clearly a different picture in, in different health boards across uh, the country. You have diff varying levels of challenges around the proportion of money that comes from the National Health Service, proportion of money that comes from local authorities, uh, the amount that you might have as a projected overspend, the amount you might have in reserves, or the projected savings you're be needing to make in each of the next three years. C can each of you just set out what that means in terms of money that you need to find in each of the next three years? When I say find, I mean either in terms of a saving or in terms of pleading for more money, whether that be from the National Health Service or indeed from a local authority. What, what level of money are you looking for? Who would like to start with that one? Yes, Moira Pringle. Um, we're in the, the process of developing a, a medium-term financial plan, but in this year we're in just now for Edinburgh, our starting gap in terms of our savings requirement was £24 million. And um, given all the demographic pressures that people have already talked about that are in the system and um, the ongoing pressures on, on public funding, I would imagine a similar, if not greater, size gap in, in each of the following few years, which I guess is why um, we have to look at doing things very differently. Um, Mary Moore. Um, in respect of 1920, our cost pressures came to about uh, £18 million, and we did get um, additional funding through the Scottish Government for about £15 million, so it left a £3 million gap, the majority of which has been addressed on a recurring basis from savings, but there is um, reliance on non-recurring solutions at this stage, which we need to be alert to. In terms of moving forward over the medium to long term um, plan, I would uh, estimate from the work that we've done with both partners that our gap in terms of it, if cost pressures could continue to be of the order of three to five million pound. That is assuming the level of Scottish Government funding that has been available until now continues in, in future years. It still doesn't create enough financial capacity to address the increases in demographic growth, as we have spoken about, and also the um, aspirations to further develop the uh, services, particularly the third sector, early intervention and prevention services. Thank you. Thank you. Greg MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kedvina. Uh, yeah, we, we have a, a similar budget gap as, as uh, Mary outlined there. So for the 2019-20 um, financial year, we're looking at around about a £5 million budget gap, and we'd anticipate that being a similar level of challenge over the, the um, certainly the medium term, year on year. Um, uh, that's probably quite a significant element of that is in relation to additional demand, so de demographic changes, um, which we recognise that, that that's very much about transformation and de de delivering services in a different way. Um, is how we would certainly hope to, to manage that demand differently. Um, but the balance of that is very much about cost increases, um, pay inflation, normal inflation, etc. Um, but that managing demand is a, is a big part of how we would want to um, deal with this into the future. Thank, Thank you. Very much. So, so 31 integrated authorities, three integrated authorities in front of us, uh, one saying a gap of 24 million in each of possibly the next three years, another one saying three to five million each of the next three years, another one saying five million in each of the next three years, times that by the, by 10 broadly, in terms of what we're talking about in terms of local authorities or integrated authorities across the country, 
we're talking at almost three hundred million pounds a year as a gap of what's uh, needed in terms of either savings or in terms of further investment. That's a massive, massive <coughs> amount of money, and that's not just in terms of transformation. That can't just be about recurring, non-recurring. Some of that is going to be cuts to the bone in terms of services and impact on service users. What What is that projection in terms of what that means for your service users and for services you provide? So, Judith Proctor. I think it's going to, to mean some, we've all talked about transformation and it's probably important then to, to, to really think about well, what, what do we mean when we say that, you know, and it, it will be lots of different things. It is about how we use our uh, traditional services quite differently. It will be about how we utilise money that may already be in the system to do things differently in the community. It will most definitely be about how we use technology to support people at home or in a community setting. It will get us into discussion about the, the, the set-aside, the, the acute funding, how we potentially use that. And if you look at the, the, the conversation that we've had briefly about the uh, number of delayed discharges in Edinburgh, not only is somebody being delayed in hospital when they're ready to go home, not good for that individual. It's someone being cared for, you know, in the, an inappropriate place. It's, a, it's, it's us not using public funding properly and appropriately. If we're really able to tackle that and do it in a way, as, as Eddie says, which is safe, effective, um, useful and, and uh, appropriate alternative deliveries of care, that should, um, when we go back to the intent of integration and the legislation, that should enable us to deliver services within a sustainable financial envelope. So I think it, it gets into, and these are some of the conversations, just again picking up Val's point, about the national conversation that we need to get into this. Our services will have to look very, very different indeed, because we can th do things differently over, over coming years. And I think we have to be really quite open and transparent about what that difference will look like. I and I imagine the other two local authorities would accept that as well. But interestingly, what, what Eddie Fraser said earlier on was around invest. So a lot of it's about investing in order to be able to save. But if you have to make a £300 million saving across all integrated authorities this year and every year for the next three years, there doesn't seem to be much room for investment to save. It just seems about save and we'll use the clunky word. We'll use the nice term of transformation uh, as we save. There is going to be a cost to this, a human cost to this, isn't there, in terms of services and service users? Should we not be, as part of that, honesty with the public about that transformation that needs to take place? Honesty with the public in terms of what's going to mean for services and for service users? The last part of that should we be honest be you know the public and local communities absolutely because we've got no credibility if we're not but you can invest in ways you know that actually still deliver even within you know like the calendar year uh, in terms of savings so we had projected you know an increase of three percent in our care at home social care costs so to mitigate against that we employed more occupational therapists, more intensive social care workers. So it's when people first contact us asking us for these services, we actually work with people to make sure they're as independent as they can be, you know, and, you know, and therefore the size of the social care package is less. But it's not only about being independent. I think one of the big issues for us just now is to make sure people are included in local communities and some of our work in you know East Ayrshire has been that work that's not directly delivered by the health and social care partnership. It is our work around and you know I'm not being flippant, tea dances and different things that our people are included in local communities. Our public health colleagues would tell us that the impact of being excluded, the impact of social isolation is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So actually the impact on health of working properly in local communities and including people in local communities is massive. And that's some of our focus. That's that part when Craig spoke about how do we reduce demand? That's what we need to do. And then when people do need the social care services, they have to be there and they have to be of the highest quality so as that they are responsive to people's needs. So it's, it is trying to reduce demand by doing things differently. And we've achieved that up till now. I think we're right to say as we go forward, how do we do that? When we talk about how integration joint boards work, they don't work in isolation. Some of our busy, biggest successes in the areas is when we work very closely with housing and we look at different housing models to actually make sure that works. So at one time, 
you know, our, you know, your supported accommodation, our high need supported accommodation, particularly in rural areas, had vacancies in it. And you know, like they were sick because people didn't want to move there. Now what we see is a lot more activity going on there. So our vibrant communities teams go in there and they actually have lots of activities that serve not only the people who live in the supported accommodation that are now full, but also the local community. And we're actually driving, you know, like less demand for paid social care through the types of route. So, so that, that's what we mean by, by transformation. It's actually changing people's experience. On, uh, Anna's heart, Roman. Uh, th thanks, and I, I completely agree in terms of what integrated authorities are trying to do in very, very difficult circumstances. You are, have the right intentions, absolutely, and, and what you're doing in communities is transformative. Uh, but doesn't it come back to the point around £300 million broadly across 31 local integrated authorities uh, of savings that we made in a year means there are going to be budgetary pressures. And can you just say this final question from me? Uh, say a bit about, we hear a lot around record investment in our National Health Service. And at the same time, we have local authorities uh, screaming about budgetary pressures that they face. <coughs> say a bit about how the budgetary pressures that are faced on local authorities, what that means for how much they can then inf invest from their budgets into integrated authorities and how that could help perhaps bridge some of that £300 million gap. I would like Valdez, Okay, um, I, I think um, I, I think we we all need to speak from our own um, perspective in this. And when you mentioned three hundred million, I guess that's not my challenge personally. That is our challenge um, nationally. Um, but again, I I want to build on what my colleagues have said to say there is an honest conversation. But the honest conversation for me at this point is not about closures and shots. It's about replacement redesign. It's about an honest conversation about change happens and sometimes change is good. And building that confidence about putting something in place before you take something away sometimes, as often as we can. Um, the, the question about... Um, Sorry, I, I think we government. could do better. Yeah. Right. I think we could do better. I think that locally, I see my colleagues and, and from myself, um, locally we're having that conversation. But I think we need a bit of a scattergun approach to the, the, the communications around change, the need for change. And actually, it's a bad thing to be in hospital. I think ge the general public still believe that a hospital is a good and a safe place to be in. Now, that's no disrespect to my acute colleagues, but it's not a place to languish. It's not a place to stay. We need to have people in hospital for the reason they need to be in, and they need to get that flow and get people back on their feet and back home as quickly as possible. So I think we're having those conversations, but sometimes it's hard to shift the, the global thinking, the, the national thinking around this. I think change can be good, change is necessary, and we need, I suppose we need some support in, in the integration authorities to actually try to get that message across. Coming back to the budget, um, I think from a South Lanarkshire point of view, um, the, the NHS, um, have not been um, funded um, the full NRAC allocation. So that means that there's a 0.2% less allocation, which uh, accounts for about £9 million. Um, pounds. So from a South Lanarkshire point of view, that, that is um, status quo. We've, we've worked really hard um, to balance the budget, and we have done. Um, but that's, um, as Marie was saying, it's going to be more and more challenging, particularly in 2021, 21, 22, in terms of not being able to find um, recurring funding. So we're, we're all getting into this place of re redesign and transformation. From the local authority side, um, the, the sympathy I have with my local authority colleagues, um, because they are um, very um, supportive um, to the IJB, is that I see my corporate management team colleagues from housing, um, not so much education, because education is a little bit more protected, but from housing, roads, the different functions within the local authority around community and the kind of um, interconnectedness that we need to have in the way that Eddie describes. If you protect education and social care and social work, um, then you know our other colleagues around that team are having to take a bigger um, slice of their budgets. So that's a tension in itself, but one that um, we need to keep getting around and keeping, keep having a conversation and a vision for what is the best for our communities in the whole, not just about um, the different types of budgets, but, but there are real sort of tensions around that. 
very much. George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, one of the things I'd like to ask about the integrated joint board is you've got to look at different ways to work. You've got to look at it. the whole idea of the integrated joint board was to look at different ways to uh, do things and deliver services. Now, as we've heard today, people hate change and it's always going to be difficult. So my question would be is how do we take that next transformational step, that change to services? Uh, you know, because you're bridging, you're at the coalface, you're bridging between the health board and the, the council itself, which is a great place to be. It's challenging, but it's a great place to be. In my opinion, having worked as a councillor previously as well. So most importantly, how do we make that transformational change and how do we really importantly make sure we take the public and everyone with us as well in order that we can uh, they see benefit in what we're trying to provide here? Eddie Fraser. I, I suppose, you know, again, it comes back to how we work with local communities. So as well as clearly being the Chief Officer of East Ayrshire IGIB, I'm a Director of NHS Ayrshire and Arnhem and a Director of East Ayrshire Council. When I go out and I talk to local communities, none of them care about any of that. They actually there about what we're there to talk about, how service could be delivered to local communities and what are the priorities of local communities. So for us, you know, we've worked with community-led action plans. Our 31 local communities, they look at what their priorities are, they look at what their action plans are, and we then look to see how we can serve them as local communities. The, the roles that we've done around participatory budgeting and the IGIB alongside the council in particular have taken this really seriously, and we've seen local communities prioritise how money should be spent, has really seen big changes, particularly to that preventative agenda that people have been you know, like, uh, speaking about. So for us, you know, this is not about simply sustainability of the integration joint board. It's not about sustainability of the council or of the health board. It's about how we talk about that all together. And I suppose that's the privileged position that, that, that we get to sit in, about how, as you say, we bridge eh, across that. So it, it's about not doing it, you know, I know this might sound flippant, it's not doing it to communities. It's talking with communities about what the right things to do in their local areas are. Talking to local communities, talking to local people, including GPs who work in their communities. Talking with local schools about what the priorities there are. And I think that's our way forward. Our way forward in East Ayrshire is to have our 31 local community-led action plans to work with our local communities about how we take things forward and meeting local need. And people are very honest. So we do do the village hall, town hall meetings and actually talk to people and it's, be honest with people about what our pressures are and then listen to people about how they might be resolved. An example I could give to you is just now we're looking at, at as, as we call, we develop place. And that's not primarily been done by the Health and Social Care Partnership. It's been done by our department under, you know, let's say for communities. But that's how we get local people who work in a local area can do a range of different, different jobs. So just now, if in Dalmellington somebody pulled their community alarms, I would likely need to send one of my social care vans across from Cumnock across to Dalmellington to see if the person's OK. But there are guys working around there who are cutting the grass. How can they not go and chat the door and make sure they're OK? They're the types of things about actually making sure we get the best resources to serve local communities. The other example that, you know, around place, and it's about the totality of funding is, there's no point in saying you just cut the grass, you know, once a month, you know, like, no matter what the weather's like. You know, it's about giving people devolving power to their local communities to do whatever's important to the local communities. And that's the type of thing that I think we need to do to make ourselves more sustainable. I think, again, it's why... It's important for me always to say IGIBs don't work in isolation. They work there alongside, yes, the council and the health board, but also the wider community planning partners. So our relationship with Ayrshire College, our relationship with Police Scotland, our relationship with the Scottish Fire and Rescue are all really important to us in that wider community planning, you know, that arena. So, so we do see... You know, like Police Scotland doing work around trauma. We, we do see Scottish Fire and Rescue going in and doing some of these safety visits. We see a whole range of different engagement going across. I think that's a future public service that we deliver, that we're part of. Well, this is I um, would agree with um, what Eddie is saying. We're not quite as established as um, Eddie is, but we're certainly moving in that direction. Um, I, I think um, we do use the word transformation a lot and sometimes we try not to. 
Um, but one of the things about transformation is that when you start the journey, you don't know where you're going to end up. And that's really one of the challenges for us because if you make a change and you can say, this is what it's going to look like, this is what we put in place, then it's so much easier to bring people along with you. But when you're saying, you know, this is going to take about three to five years, what we're hoping to do is we're going to look at the data as it emerges, we're going to do the best thing for you. It's very nebulous and it's far more difficult for people to really um, hook on to what you're going to do and have confidence. So sometimes there's a leap of faith required in transformation. So uh, I think that um, my approach, our approach to that is around engagement again and it's around um, very full engagement with our communities. Um, it's around, um, uh, recently we, we launched our next three-year strategic commissioning plan, 19 to 22. Um, we, we invest a huge amount of energy and time going out to our communities, asking them what they wanted, what their priorities were. We did it in two phases. We went out first and said, what do you want? We actually collated all the information, then we brought it back and we said, this is what you said. Do you agree? So to try and prioritise and then to try and say, well, actually, in terms of your priority, what's number one and what's number ten? So early intervention and prevention was the first one. Ironically, of engagement, yeah. the answers you tend to get surprise yourself and like myself in the past when in the council when we did uh, engagement like that the answers you got back were rather surprising you know so then how do you then take that on to the next stage in your case to actually uh, put that forward to the public well I, well I go back to the, the the question that I answered earlier and um, if we are very 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 surprised if we're surprised we need to listen that's what we're there to do. So we're there to listen, we're there to make sense of, we're there to understand. And we're there to work in a very big partnership about place. So it's not about any one thing, it's about place and it's around people in their place. So we need to understand that. But we need to, to check that against the data. We need to check that against the policy direction. So we need to make some sensible decisions about how we start to take forward some of those priorities with our communities. One of the little examples that I have, and it's a very small example, and I hope the people of Tarbrax don't mind me mentioning this. We're not, I'm not sure where we're going to go with this, but it is a listening one, if you like. Um, we, we have a programme called Building and Celebrating Communities, which is around trying to address some of the issues around that 300 million that we're talking about earlier. So it's trying to do things really different, but it's very much building the strengths in your community. So we're, we're having quite a lot of discussion with our communities. Now, in Tarbrax, the, there was a meeting about two or three weeks ago where quite a lot of active local people are saying, you know, we've only got 400 people in our village. We've got, you know, some of them are ageing. Some, the, some of the kind of themes that Eddie talked about earlier about trying to keep people well, social isolation, people keep it involved, include. Um, so some of these folk are coming back to us to say, you know, how would it be if you paid us to undertake, to pay us for the care um, as families with our local communities? But what we would do is we would care for folk, but we would do the other stuff that they need, which might be, you know, taking them for prescriptions. It might be taking them for a walk. It might be walking their dog. It might be cutting their grass or whatever. So it's really joined up thinking from our communities. Sometimes I think when we go into the consultation engagement piece, we've traditionally been a bit frightened about what we've been, we'll be asked. And like Eddie, I think our communities are very realistic and I think they don't over demand largely. So I think we need to be braver about having these honest conversations in our communities. Judith Proctor. Um, it won't surprise you to know that I agree with uh, most of what my colleagues have said about, about these approaches. I think, obviously, there's a, a, a variation to this in Edinburgh, a very, very large, very diverse um, city. But the approach um, about working in and with communities where they are is an absolute principle of, of health and social care integration. And of course, another constituent in all of this is how we support our staff to, to, to change. And I think a key one for this, uh, for us in Edinburgh, is about how we work at a locality level. So we've got four localities in the city, and each of those is actually very large. 
Um, so how we empower and support our um, frontline managers uh, and staff and teams to work in that very cooperative, co-productive way with people. And I know that these sound like jargony words, but actually they get to the heart of what we're trying to do. That's really, really important. So, so we're doing a number of things in, in, in this area. Um, we are developing the, a, a three conversation approach. So we're, we're trying to embed in the way that we all work uh, from practitioners right the way through embedding that in three three conversations to really humanize the care that we provide and that is centered around you know the individual the support that they need to live a good life in the community connected to the sorts of things that in the community that Val and Eddie have de described and in parallel to that how we then invest in communities community provision third sector organizations communities and neighborhoods themselves to, to create the, the, the vibrant and resilient uh, supports that, 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 that people need. So there's a big element of our strategic planning around that, and a big element of the hearts and minds with our staff and our teams around that as well, uh, how they can be working in that way. And we've got some really good examples of our, our locality managers leading that engagement with partners, with the police, with, with uh, GPs locally, uh, with third sector organisations in the community them, themselves around the, you know, what will make a difference here? What are some of the things that we can do? And and they may be surprising things, uh, but they're really, really important things. And it is about community cohesion, community growing schemes, you know, allotments, things like that make a tremendous difference um, in, in communities. M more broadly than that, as a, as a public sector partnership uh, across Edinburgh, we're having a lot of discussions around that place-based approach. Um, and when opportunities arise to develop new capital uh, builds, how do we get around that as, as joint partners to think what could we do here? Uh, it might go beyond uh, we need to build a new school as a, as a local authority to, okay, we need to do that, but what are the other opportunities that sit around this investment in this community whereby we can deliver services very differently in a far more joined up way. So there's a lot of strategic thinking happening about that as an approach. We do a lot of work with our partners in the council and the NHS around um, opportunities for development and how we might invest from um, traditional institution-based care into housing models that can support uh, more people differently in a more sustainable way in the community. So there's lots of discussion around that and I think it is really, really gratifying that increasingly we're seeing that come through the community planning approach with, with our broad partners. We're all, we're all trying to do the same thing and I think we'll do it far better if we do it collectively. I just wanted to in on that because I think for Alex and I as um, Edinburgh representatives, we have people come to see us who say the polar opposite of what you've just said in terms of um, how they feel they're included. And just looking at the Pilton, um, you know, Scotland's oldest community health project, the Pilton Health Centre, you know, they were told about their imminent funding um, hours before. And just looking at all their comments online from that time, they don't feel they were ever included in any future proofing or discussions around service redesign. So what you've just said, what would you say to people from Pilton? Because they don't feel any of that's taken place. Yep. It's, so those are different processes. That was a, a, a grants process that was overseen by the Integration Joint Board and grants processes by their very nature uh, are, are quite challenging. Uh, you, you may or may not be aware that, uh, that the grant that we had to distribute uh, under the Health and Social Care Partnership was made up of, of different elements from, from both uh, previous NHS funding and, and council grant. And against the 14 million that was available, we had 35 million pounds worth of, of bids against that. Um, we undertook a very thorough process within the, the, the IGB to consider. And we did this with our partners. We did this with our partners in the third sector, and we were very, very supported by the third sector interface around that, uh, to develop a, an approach that, as far as was possible in those circumstances, was, was felt to be by the IGB fair and proportionate. I think for some organisations, very, very well aware, and um, some were not successful in drawing down the funding. Uh, but through that, we did actually see the development of new um, health and care um, organisations in the community. So there's something really, really positive about that, because this has to be both about growth of new uh, responses that can be adaptive to the, the, the current needs within communities. 
as well as sustaining some, some organisations that were able to develop uh, new approaches uh, as well. We, we also um, worked, we believe, very closely with organisations in the community and with EVOC, our third sector interface partners, on some of the transitions uh, that, that might be needed. We worked very closely with the, the, the organisation you met you, you, you mentioned um, after the decision was made and, and, and colleagues met with them several occasions to, to look at how they might rationalise what they do now or secure other funding sources or work, work differently. So, so we believe we've undertaken as thorough a process as possible um, and our board obviously is holding us uh, to account in terms of impact assessments. Have we un undertaken quite um, in-depth work with them over that? It remains something obviously that is quite, quite difficult for organisations and, and we recognise that um, and obviously the board is very interested with our partners in looking at the impact that those those things have. Can I ask for each of you um, a couple of points? Uh, first of all, for uh, in relation to this current uh, budget, this year's budget, um, whether social care contributions, additional social care money are provided to health boards, has that all been passed on to yourselves? And secondly, have your local authorities? Uh, taken the opportunity to, to not or to reduce the contribution they're making to uh, social care budgets in your area. Craig MacArthur. Yeah, I've just confirmed that yes, in terms of our budget setting process, all the additional contributions from both health and um, local authority partners were passed on and the local authority elected not to take um, a further reduction um, at, at East Ayrshire. Ari Moy. All Scottish Government funding has been passed on to the IJB. We did agree a small um, amount of savings uh, from a transformational point of view with the local authority partner that we felt uh, could be implemented in year. But over the last three years, uh, particularly the local authority partner has minimised the level of savings that it has actually asked of the IJB partner, um, being supportive of the agenda. And similarly, on the NHS Lanarkshire side, they've passed over all the funding and they have have also uh, continued to manage the risk associated with budget pressures on the set-aside services. So again, it's, it's a, um, a, a good working relationship and a supportive one. Thank you. Much. Yes, very similar position in Edinburgh. Um, and we, we in Edinburgh have a, a budget setting protocol, which we've agreed with our, our partners. And I think Judith mentioned earlier that we meet with them um, regularly on a, on a tripartite basis. And I think the, the kind of strength and benefit of these discussions are one of the things which will help us um, move IGBs forward because we're only going to really progress as I think was pointed out in the, the recent MSG report, if we all understand each other's position and have a shared view of the financial position of the IGB. But to specifically answer your question, yes, NHS Lothian passed on f in full its 2.6% up uplift and a share of its um, other funding, because like Lanarkshire, Lothian are below NRAC parity, and the council also passed on its share of the, the local government settlement in full, and um, potentially subject to performance, they have set aside some additional funding as well for the IGB. Okay, thanks very much. Around the issues of funding gaps that um, you all addressed in answer to Anna Sauer, clearly part of this is going to be uh, ar uh, around efficiency savings. Are there is there scope for ongoing efficiency savings, uh, or is this all about uh, fundamental change? Is Arda Pringle? Um. In, in Edinburgh, we set out a kind of three horizon um, approach to financial sustainability, which, which Judith referred to earlier. So part of our programme is about gripping control and being more efficient with what we've got. Part of our programme is about um, redesigning existing services. And then another part, which is the three to five year part, is about transforming services and doing things very, very differently and changing the, the conversation that we have with the people of Edinburgh. So no, it, it's, it's not just all about cuts to services. Eddie Fraser or Craig MacArthur. Eddie Fraser. There are some parts of, of what we do that are very difficult to see how we deliver in terms of efficiencies. You know, much of the services that, that we deliver, particularly through the NHS, are staffing. 
So, for instance, you know, we have 42 health visitors. You know, if the health visitors, and that's part of, you know, the totality of the number in terms of the additional 500. Um, so, if they all go for band six to band seven, that's a cost, you know, to me. I understand the benefit we get out of that, but it's also a specific cost to me. And, you know, I don't see a, a saving there. In terms of if we're going to continue, you know, like to shift and support people in the communities, you know, again, you know, I don't see how that would be effective then to cut my number of, you know, community nurses in, in terms of doing that with our um, priorities around mental health. Again, looking at my community mental health teams, I'm not clear I would want to reduce that. And therefore, if within, you know, a budget, you know, you're asked to look at cash release efficiency savings, actually, if all you've got is a staff and budget, it's very difficult to actually square the, you know, the things in what we're doing. So, so the, the answer about can we keep doing efficiencies all the time, the answer to that has to, at the end of the day, quite frankly, be no. You know, at some point, you know, we have to look at, make sure we have the full funding to deliver in terms of what we're doing. And that's where either transformation and or additional funding comes in. Because overall, again, transformation, you know, will only happen you know, like if there is money to move from one side of the business to, to, to another. And again, the scale of what's needed to deliver for our local communities, I'm not clear if that scale of funding is available, for instance, within the acute service to actually transfer back out. That that That's not been evidenced, you know, that, that that's there in terms of the scale and number of, you know, beds that we need to close in the acute estate to deliver an effective community estate. So we, we can be efficient. We can look at skill mix, but we also need to listen about how are we actually delivering these services and everything can't be about efficiency. Some of it's going to be transformation and some of it likely will need to be additionality. Uh, Thank you. I totally agree with everything Eddie has just said. The um, scale of the challenge is such that, yes, we do need to embark on transformational change, but we absolutely do need to identify additional funding that will allow us to progress um, this agenda. In terms of looking for more efficiency savings, that exercise, that um, uh, aspiration will never stop. We will always continue to look for improvements in service delivery. But, we've, but over the last 10 years in particular, um, local authorities have been um, managing within tighter financial constraints and as Val has highlighted within NHS Lanarkshire there is a good effective financial management but it is within a, a reduced financial pot with, the, with being below the NRAC. So in terms of being realistic about what can be achieved moving forward then we have to be careful that we build on sound financial plans. And a lot of the transformational change agenda and the outcomes from that, both in terms of financial savings and in terms of performance, it's still to be tested. And a whole system approach definitely does need to be adopted. But it's how realistic is it that both partners can continue to help us find savings and how realistic is it that we can find savings from essentially what are frontline service, services that have been delegated to the IGIB? Um, thank you. A number of changes the Scottish Government has made or is making. Uh, one is the medium term financial framework with planning their own funding five years forward uh, for the NHS. Another is the financial requirements placed on health boards. Uh, changes have been have been made there and the requirements have been increased and of course government sometimes criticised for it but, but will provide one-off in-year additional funds for for example delayed discharge or, or, or waiting times initiatives whatever it may be how many how far do those changes offer opportunities f to strengthen your own financial planning and and and, and uh, how far can you take into account what in-year payments when you're addressing the kind of challenges that you've described in balancing budgets on an annual basis? Eddie Fraser. Uh, I think, you know, if we can get, you know, uh, clarity around three-year settlements, for instance, in terms of our funding, 
it gives you longer and you know just as importantly it gives you know like our um, some of the people we commission services from particularly around the third sector the independent sector it gives them a bit longer we can give them more surety if we know what, what we're doing in terms of our funding so you know it's, it's small amounts you know we on an annual basis can lightly predict within one or two percent what our budget you know would be but if I've, you've got a 250 million pound budget you know two percent is five million pounds and that's a lot of services that you're having to you know adjust at the end of the you know the year so so the longer term you know budgets and budget setting that we have helps us align that better with our strategic plan helps us see where we would shift services from and therefore resources from around and i think that's that is you know uh, very helpful uh, for us in terms of of in year you know like uh, settlements you know that like we're always keen to, to work at change and quite often in year settlements also come with a level of particular support in terms of how you test change how that's learning how we can take something and embed wider and i think that is helpful as well in terms of where we are as long as it's on that that basis if it's a, a, a reactive thing you know that actually that's coming in I think that's more difficult because sometimes if it's reactive, it's difficult for us to go out and just suddenly recruit staff from somewhere to actually deliver against that reaction. But if it's about a progressive investment that we get, you know, so, so recently we have had confirmed further investment in technology enabled care around one of our particular lo localities over a couple of years. And we can think then, how are we going to put in, you know, funding around, you know, like clinical leadership? How are we going to put the social care support around that? How are we going to communicate with the public what we're trying to achieve? So that type of kind of in-year investment is helpful. But if it's very reactive, saying, you know, like Cross House Hospital's full, can you somehow take people out of there? Not that we have delayed discharge, but that's another story. Um, but but you, you can't just magic up. The, the social care service, you know, you can't just go out and suddenly recruit social care workers, you know, to, to actually deliver on that. Ms Proctor. On, on, on that, and I think it is important when in-year monies come in, they don't often come direct to the IJB, you know, through, through the process that we've been in. But what's really, really important in that is that we are in discussion with our partners about how some of that money could be used differently. So you talk about funding coming in to, to health boards to help them address some of the pressures that they have. Often the solution uh, to those pressures, or sometimes the solution to those pressures, might be about investing more in a community setting uh, to, to achieve a, a, a long longer lasting change there. So I think that is really, really important. Um, I do think we recognise, and I think we said it in our submission from Edinburgh, the challenge that we're in with one year settlement in, in, in partnerships means that this is a continual process of discussion around the budget. And whilst I think in some ways that is useful, because it helps us understand each other's position, it helps us have those live conversations about how we as a whole system and, and, and people involved in that whole system uh, will, will operate. It, it can mean that we are spending an awful lot of time on that uh, when we will want to be focusing on the, the change and the transformation that, that, that we're in. So I think any opportunities that, that committee have to consider the levers that might already be there for, um, for, for government and for partnerships and for the, the, the broader partnership uh, to use that can help that would be, I think, very, very welcome f f from our, our position, such as the thinking over the, the course of the three years rather than always in the, in, in the year. Uh, and I, and I, I think that the levers are there for, for, for government to do that without any uh, significant or specific change to the legislation that already exists. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mary Mai, do you want to come back? No. no. Okay. Thank you very much. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, what progress has been made in linking budgets to outcomes and to, co to comply with legislative requirements in this area? <laughs> Outcome budgeting. Ongoing challenge. Eddie Fraser. You know, we are, as part of the integration scheme, required to report twice a year to both the council and to, to the health board. So we report once a year in relation to our strategic plan and we report once a year in terms of our, to our performance report. So our performance report is totally built around, you know, the, the national outcomes. And for us, there's, there's 12 national outcomes, and that's because uh, 20 national outcomes, and that's because we also have children and we have justice as well as, you know, adult services within that. So, so our whole reports in terms of how we report 
are based around uh, the, the outcomes. They're based around, you know, getting it right for every child for our children. They're based around the community justice, you know, like agenda in terms of, you know, like, uh, criminal justice services. And they're based around, you know, like our you know, wealth and well-being outcomes, you know, in terms of how we deliver. So, so how we do that is very much in, engaged within that. And it's not just about how efficient our services are. It is about how are we changing how do we change to actually invest also in the preventative stuff? How do we invest in, invest in well-being as well as in health and social care? So, so you'll see in our, our reports that that is how we, we do it. How do we work in partnership with housing colleagues? How are we working in partnership with our education colleagues in terms of some of the inequalities we see there in terms of that? So, so for us, we, we, we align our whole reporting structures around the national outcomes. Well, this is on. Um, thank you, convener. Um, we we do likewise. I think just to to um, build on the conversation, one of the and again, it's in our return. One of the things that we have um, adopted in uh, Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire is um, a, a, a tool called contribution analysis, um, which is uh, around identifying how confident. Um, you are, that not just the finances, but any of your inputs, any of your resource, so it could be time, it could be money, it could be people, but how confident are you that that's leading you to um, a positive outcome for you, the nine national outcomes? Um, and and it's proving, to, it's been a, a number of years in the making, um, and it's proving now to show some evidence that we can connect what we are putting into the system to supporting the nine national outcomes. So, um, for example, or the kind of methodology is around um, identifying um, what, what are the, the resources that you put in. Um, it's then about trying to set out a plan, uh, sort of like a logic modelling about what would you expect the outcomes to be in a short, medium and long term. It's then about interrogating um, all of the different kind of resources that might claim um, success in leading to that outcome and basically saying and, and, and really sort of narrowing down which of the areas of investment have actually given us the greatest effect in terms of efficiency and effect this outcome and disregarding the ones that may not have contributed as much so it's a constant sort of review and cycle of looking at what we're doing how all of the kind of things that we're putting uh, uh, together in terms of investment are contributing disregarding those that aren't and trying to get to some kind of a science around the link between finance and outcomes. Um, I think the starting position is that it's a vexing question um, and it's a complex area, so it's not about an input and an output. So having a tool like this has been very helpful to us in um, South Lanarkshire. I have an example I can give you in terms of best value if you would like it, but I'll need to read it. Um, so it's around technology because our last um, outcome is around best value. So in terms of our tech programme, we have looked at how the investment has impacted on that national outcome nine, which is resources used effectively and efficiently. And this is about our home monitoring programme. So an average of 4.3 blood pressure appointments are avoided by remote monitoring. And if you take 4.3 by 3,545 patients that are already registered in South Lanarkshire, by five pounds 41 and by 10 minutes um, and a, for a practice nurse appointment, you have a saving of 80, just over 82,000 um, pounds. So it's a, you can see why I read it. Um, so basically what we're looking at is um, the contribution that the technology enabled care, the home mobile monitoring, the impact that is having on that ninth outcome. Um, and, you know, we say that, you know, that there's over £80,000 um, of a, um, a, a saving in there in terms of the way we're remodelling that. It's not always cash releasing, so I probably need to make that point, but probably what it will be doing is responding to some of the, the questions earlier around managing demand. 
um, and the demographic demand and the type of demand that's coming towards us. Thank you. Did, uh, Marla, did you want to add? Um, I think it's probably fair to say in Edinburgh it's, it, that linking finance to, to outcomes is not something we've made um, very much progress with. We are, however, um, looking at how we make an investment in, in evaluation generally. I think that the whole idea of linking money to outcomes, is, is, as Val has indicated, is not... It's not a straightforward thing to do. Um, I think in, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship with investing some money in any service and what that outcome is, because outcomes are delivered through a variety of services. So I think it's quite a complex thing to get into, but I think we will be visiting Lanarkshire to find out their, more about their approach. Fair enough. National health and wellbeing outcomes. What support uh, has been provided by the Scottish Government to help you develop um, integrated authorities develop reporting in this area? Judith. Um, we have uh, support locally that uh, we work with uh, both both our partners in NHS Lothian and in the, in the council in terms of some of that evaluation and the intelligence-led uh, data gathering and reporting, but also the list analysts uh, who are provided to each partnership through the ISD, Information Statistics Division, uh, within Scottish Government. We found that an invaluable resource and support. Um, I, I think, um, as Moira's indicated, there's no one side fits all and, and often the conversations that we're having with, with those colleagues is this is the sort of thing that we want to try and find out, we want to understand this um, and our, our colleagues you know, our, our experts in, in, in this field will, will usually help us apply a, this is the information that we could help you gather that would, would, would help us interpret uh, the outcome there so um, we're, we are working uh, I, I hope quite well with our, our, our support from ISD they're embedded locally with our own um, data colleagues which I think again is a very very important thing, it's not something that, that is done and sort of lands in Edinburgh and then goes away again. It becomes embedded in our system, so it understands the way that we work. Uh, so that is very helpful. But as, as, as my colleague Moira has said, we're also looking at how we strengthen that further, particularly around transformation. So when we're talking about this is the change that we want to make and we believe that that will have a better outcome and we believe that that may help us manage within our resources, we want really good evaluation right the way across to tell us are we going in the right direction, do we need to trim our sales, uh, or do we need to... to, to, to change uh, what we're doing completely. So it's a, it's a very, very important underpinning. Okay. Uh, Fraser and then Val de Souza. Just say there are a couple of examples that we've been doing recently, you know, with different parts of, of government. So alongside the integration team, the chief officers have been trying to look at best practice in terms of discharge from hospital, trying to look at variation and then share that across to see what areas are doing well, what areas are not doing well, and actually use the self-evaluation to enter into conversations with each other, and also enter into you know different you know like benchmarking. That's not just about looking at numbers; it's going across and visiting each other, and actually the teams visiting each other and and doing that. So that's one area where we work with the integration team. One of the other things, and although some of this data is still quite acute focused, it actually drives interest for us at the um, in the IGIBs is, you know, the new tool that they call the Atlas of Variation. And it looks at the, the, the variation in different, you know, health procedures across Scotland. So, so for instance, you know, there are much more, you know, proportionally hip, you know, operations in Ayrshire and Lair and there is other areas. And, um, you know, it's done very simply in terms of maps showing shades and that. And then it starts to get you to ask the question, why? Is that about clinical variation? Is that about the health in the communities? Is that because of obesity in our local communities? So, so, so we're starting to get, you know, a, quite a, a lot of rich data, I think, from, you know, government that actually helps us ask the questions, how could we change uh, the health of our local communities? What's the big priorities around that? And it's not simply that, well, you know, the consultants in Eastern Ireland must be deciding to do too many hips. It's actually, if you go a step back, and actually look at the health of our population, they're required. And actually, why they're required? Is it about obesity? Is it about community health services? So we get quite a lot of data, and our job is obviously to make sure that we translate that data into meaningful you know, information and then take actions to actually deliver against that. Very much. Well, this is. 
Thank you, convener. And the only thing I would um, add really is um, around, um, it, it, we've, we've got very good support um, from the Scottish Government, I think that, that was your question around ISD and, and around what we call the big six, the unscheduled care, the delayed discharges, accident emergency admissions, um, etc. So very, very good um, uh, help around that and support around that um, and nationally we, we um, are growing that support. Um, the point I would make, I suppose, in this discussion is around the qualitative data. So I think what we're trying to do more is listen to patient and client, um, our, our, our um, resident stories. What are their stories? So what feedback are we getting from people about their experience? What's their experience of services? Um, and that's the bit that I suppose is more on the, not the input-output bit, it's the more of the sort of what are we contributing and what outcomes are people um, living better lives? Are they keeping themselves healthier? Are they able to look after themselves more? Do they have the information when they need? Do they have the right interventions when they need? So what are people telling us about that? And I think that's an area that we collectively recognise that we would want to go stronger in, and I think we're, we're working on that. Um, one of the things that we've done in South Lanarkshire is I've appointed a communications um, manager and um, the, the, the point of this is around, the, as, as you can probably gather, the engagement and communication piece is really, really big for us in terms of what we do locally. But again, going back to that conversation about what we need to do maybe nationally and to grow that. Um, but the, the idea of bringing a communications manager in was to link um, the not just to respond to and react to the um, requests um, that we get in the system every single day, whether it's from the media, from a whole lot of different um, sources, but actually to link um, the communications from the partnership to the nine national outcomes, so to proactively communicate what we're doing and how we're doing that and how we can um, link um, the different um, parts of our work together. So that will help us with our outcomes as well and our patient stories. Thank you, Thank you very much. Quick supplementary from Miles Briggs. Thank you. I just wanted to come back to a point which Eddie Fraser made with regards to outcomes and the third sector. Now, obviously, in the legislation which established IJBs, they weren't part of um, the table discussion at the, the early start of integration. Do you think that was a mistake? And how are you trying to build the third sector involvement going forward? I know here in Edinburgh, um, the hospice movement, for example, works incredibly well um, as a charitable third sector um, organisation, but how, how do we actually really get them into discussions early on? Because often they deliver services and transformation far better than um, the NHS or local authority in moving things forward. I absolutely agree. They are, they are fundamental uh, partners to, to, to how we do this work. Uh, th this work. Um, third sector interfaces interfaces across Scotland do sit on IJBs uh, as advisory members, non-voting members of, of that. And I think that's a really, really important signal. But of course, it's the, the people that sit behind the interface and all those organisations, some of whom are working very, very locally in, in communities and in neighbourhoods uh, that, that we want to, to, to tap into. Um, I'm sure like others, um, over the years, and Edwin, it was highlighted in the Audit Scotland report, I think a huge amount of work uh, had gone on and continues to go on in Edinburgh about how we engage uh, with those partners and the work that, that we are doing. We're in uh, discussions now about our, our new strategic plan, many of those hosted by, led by third sector organisations, them contributing to that, um, us understanding their contribution to doing some of the things that maybe have been traditionally done by the, the statutory sector and them as an absolute link to communities and neighbourhoods and, the, and, the, and people in Edinburgh who we want to work with with and discuss change with. So it is really, really uh, very, very important. It's a very, very broad constituent. I think sometimes the, the danger is we, we talk about the third sector as one thing, but of course it will span from those large national, sometimes internationally uh, present organisations all the way to the hyper-local. Uh, and, and that can be quite quite difficult to, to, to span that. But uh, I, I hope we stick to the principle that they are absolute partners in the work that we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Pippa. Uh, good morning to the panel. Um, what I wanted to look at is, is um, the impact of the shift of care, the reality of the shift of care uh, from acute to community. And I know that there's a, 
An example we've been given here uh, around uh, in South Lanarkshire around uh, changing that, that direction of travel uh, toward or redirecting towards sort of community based services. And the impact of that was with the closure of a, a 30 bed elderly care ward in, in the hospital. And that's, that's the brutal reality of what we're talking about here. That's the impact on the ground uh, for our communities. And I wondered um, what challenges you faced. In, in, in making those, that kind of decision, and was was there a, a, a pushback against that? That that because uh, that, so, we're so invested, emotionally invested. We talked about this last week. We're so emotionally invested in bricks and mortar in terms of care. Um, how difficult was that? That to, to, to get to that decision. I'll do this, uh, Thank you. Yes, this is definitely one for me. Um, <laughs> The, um, it, it was tough, um, but I um, think that um, sometimes we get caught up in the before and the after and don't spend enough time talking about the relationships um, and how we build relationships when we're going from A to B. And I would say with this example, um, the relationships with the South Lanarkshire Partnership um, became very much stronger through this process. So it took about a year. It took a lot, quite a long time, but we started pretty much from scratch because when you're talking about, I guess, closing a ward like this, you um, under you know the the territory we're in with um, the integration authorities and health and social care partnership, there isn't a route map, there isn't a pathway. Um, we didn't have one. My colleagues may have one. I'll need to ask them later. But we didn't have one, so we had to start from scratch and think, how are we going to do this? Um, we started with a position where um, um, it was a care of the elderly ward. It was um, 30 individuals. Udston, it was Douglas Ward. Um, it was managed by the acute sector, so the acute sector are forgiven for thinking that the release of that money might have been theirs. However, it was in the set-aside budget. So we were very early in our agenda in trying to understand this. Um, a lot of the challenge was around um, who do we engage with, who makes the decision. Whose money is it? So they were the three big ones. Um, the engagement is an interesting piece and it would take us quite a long time because in terms of um, the integration joint boards, we are not, we don't have to comply with cell four, which would be the, the major change guidance that the NHS usually have to um, adopt. So we didn't have any guidance as such in terms of in, um, engagement. Um, so engagement was tricky and the, the best I could do was listen to my partners very actively. Um, I had to act counterintuitively because I come from a local authority background and I was actually taking some intervention from an NHS point of view. And sometimes you have to do that because you have to listen, you have to say actually this is the way this part of the system works. So there was a bit of, of that for me. Um, what we did over um, a period of time was um, we didn't want to just say this ward, which is worth or costs uh, just over a million, it's 1.072 um, million pounds. We didn't want to just say, well, how much of that should the community have? How much should the queue keep? We, we benchmarked around the country and we, we, we didn't find a science that we could sort of apply. So what we did... Um, is we got a steering group together and we plotted for each of the 30 individuals and those that would have gone before and came behind, what would their care look like in the community? What would it cost? What would it have cost if it was still in the acute sector? What would we need to put in place? And the length of stay is quite important there. So we, we applied a bit of science to this. It took us quite a long time. That was about building up trust as well. I go back to the relationship thing. It was about building up trust. It was a building up the shift to actually, you know, I think there's a lot of this money will be moving from the set aside to, to the community and we will bolster the community in order to get that whole system working, but we'll need the release of that cash. Some of it was about trying to give reassurance around risk and some of it is around the engagement with um, staff, with relatives, with um, patients themselves. The starting position was um, one point. 0.072 million, as I say. Um, the end position was that we um, agreed to £700,000 coming into the community. We agreed um, two pots of money that would stay with the acute. There was about 760000 that was in recognition of 
Um, I guess the point was that acute sector were saying that, you know, the people that we will have remaining under our watch will be a little bit more complex. So can we have a bit of recognition for that? So there was, it was negotiation, so we said, yes, that's fine. The other thing was, and Marie mentioned this earlier, the NHS have been very supportive of the IJB and they have not passed on the on costs and the uplifts of the set aside budget to the IJB. So we negotiated another 760,000 in recognition of that. But the bigger point, I guess, is that three quarters of that money with this kind of scientific methodology, and I'm not sure it's perfect, but it was kind of as good as we were going to get. Um, three quarters of that money was actually transferred to the partnership. And as a result of that, we have been able to invest. We've, we've added to it. We've, we've, done, we've put an investment of £760,000 into our four localities. And that's around getting rapid access to get folk out of hospital a little quicker and to work in our locality teams around community pharmacy, district nursing, home care, um, and, and really building our, our, our integrated teams around um, the localities. So it, was, it took a long time. People might think it's a very easy thing to do, but I ha couldn't emphasise how important the relationship building and the trying to understand each other's agenda and the shift in policy and all that, how all that knits together and very respectful relationships um, grew out of that. Um, but it was, it was one of our successes last year, so thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you know, m moving on from that, I think, again, we had this discussion um, uh, last week, Eddie. I mean, if we, if we extrapolate that out, what we're probably talking about here is, is you know, in that shift to community care away from acute, it's losing a 1,000 beds in hospitals. Are we ready for that discussion? Are we, are we ready as a, as, as a, a country to have that kind of discussion? Eddie Fraser. I think, you know, that that's where we get back to communication and actually trust. So we regularly, between the partnerships and acute colleagues, do what we call day of care audits, where we actually look at all the different patients who are in a hospital. And at any one time, between a quarter and a third of the patients within a hospital actually don't need acute hospital care. They're there because they're waiting for something else. And actually, we're back to saying if we can provide that something else, then the trust bit comes in that the acute hospitals reduce by that capacity and that we then don't fill it up again. Because actually, if you close the ward, if you move on, the, you know, there is no nurses there, there is no space there to do it. So it has to be about, you know, we've spoke a few times about using data, but it's, it's more than data. First of all, you need to start with the data. I think you do need to start with the day of care audits that really evidence that a lot of people who are sat within our hospitals every day who actually don't need to be there. Then you need to build an alternative to that. We need to build trust in the different services, both care at home and care homes. We've not mentioned care homes. So one of the fantastic relationships we have is through Scottish, you know, like care with care homes. And actually some of the work that we do about care, about physical activity, you know, the My Home Life Management programmes in care homes is these are good places to live in our local communities for people who need that level of care and much more homely environment than living in a hospital. But they are the types of conversations that, that we need to have. Anyone who I think without giving a really sound alternative to hospital care that tries to make that argument. It's not a sound foundation to make it. So I think if anyone said, should we shut a thousand, you know, like, uh, acute hospital beds and we'll do something differently, I don't think that would be very well received. I think, <laughs> I think you actually need to evidence that there is a different way of doing things and it's also a better way of doing things for the quarter to third of patients who are sitting in hospitals so who don't need to be there. Again, agree with Eddie very much, um, wholeheartedly on, on that one, and um, I think we are getting to a place where we're, we're more likely to be able to have the conversation. But it is about that balance of um, what we might change and and not do, but really celebrating the alternatives that we now know we can do safely and well in in communities. And I think it's it's a 
it's, it's a fact, isn't it? You know, a, a, a hospital, a bricks and mortar thing, it's far more recognisable in a community than some of the things that we do in supporting people in their own homes. That's largely invisible or in care homes. You know, we don't see a lot of what happens. We don't celebrate a lot of what happens. And unfortunately, some of the things that we see and read about care in the community and care in care homes is at the, you know, it's at the other end when things you know, don't go well, which is, I think, the, the by far the m minority of, of cases. So I think nationally, you know, we, we would benefit from a conversation about how is our care and support, how is our system changing, and how is that improving people's lives, and how is that, that better for people? And that whole system thing, if we're able to deliver those safe and viable alternatives in the community, it means that our acute hospitals, which are valuable resources, uh, can be working at their optimum for people that need them when they need them and for no longer than they need them for. Uh, so I think we need to think about that right the way across the change, but what we're actually putting in place and the benefits that that can have for people. Mary Thank you. In order to be ready to close a thousand beds, we do need to create the conditions that would support that. And as Eddie and Judith have both highlighted, then we, we do need safe, reliable, alternative community-based services. So within South Lanarkshire, we do have tests of change and pilot that are, pilots that are being uh, taken forward. We've spoken about telehealth and telecare and um, giving people the opportunity to manage their own care. Um, through contribution analysis, we're seeing that that is um, resulting in a drop in the uh, attendances at, um, with uh, doctors and GPs because people are able to communicate um, their, their results electronically and get feedback. So these these are, are positive steps and positive developments. Um, in, in addition to that, we've also had um, IV therapies as a test of change in a pilot where people have received that uh, the IV therapy treatment in the community and they've not needed to be admitted to hospital for that. But these are tests of change that um, predominantly are being funded from non-recurring funding solutions. The challenge now is that how do we scale up and how do we scale up to an extent where we, we can um, move the resources, move the, the care to a more appropriate place that is better for the individual, better from an efficiency point of view across the whole system, and um, then after that release the resources which is difficult to predict where those resources would be released from in the system and at what time and the complicating factor are the budget pressures and other challenges that both partners are wrestling with and that features as part of our conversation and as well highlighted with the example in Udston we did recognize that our partners do have problems therefore we could not insist on um, securing the million pound investment into the community. We felt it was a fair and appropriate response that part of that remained with the, our acute service colleagues because of the services that are critical that they are also delivering. So it, fundamentally, the point I'm probably getting to is there does need to be investment and it needs to be upfront investment if we're to de develop those safe, reliable services that we can all place confidence and reliance on. And then once we've got that, the conversation about closing the beds would be an easier one to have with the public. Thank you very much. Brian Riddle. I want to move on. If I could take that conversation a little bit further, so there's, two, there's two areas that, that interest me greatly. Um, it's the impact of the third sector um, on, uh, on, on healthcare, both in prevention and in rehabilitation and also uh, the implementation of, of technology, um, I think I think is, is of absolute paramount importance if we're going to create this, this shift in, into the community. I think that, uh, I mean, and Eddie made the point there, you talked about, you know, he said, he said I'm not being flippant about tea dances. I think that is massively important. I think that's hugely important. And the impact of the third sector on your budget. So two things here. One, what what... Uh, how is that accounted for in terms of, or, or how can you account uh, the third sector involvement within your budget? And, and we all know that the third sector budget has been hugely squeezed at the moment. It seems to be uh, a sort of easy target, if you like. Um, uh, and, and is that being factored in, in terms of your ability to, to uh, manage your budget? 
a difficult question. Uh, Eddie Fraser. So, so I think one of the, the first things that, that we did to put that flag of how important that was is in our strategic plan, when you look at what our priority is, that prevention and early intervention sits right there at the top of where, where we want to be uh, in terms of our, our strategic plan. How we work with our third sector partners, you know, that again, you know, that is, is very much about funding them, working with them as partners. So many of our third sector partners in East Ayrshire are specifically that. They're not commissioned services. So when we work with, you know, the, the CVO, when we work with, you know, the CAB, when we work with East Ayrshire Carers, when we work with East Ayrshire Advocacy Services, these are partnerships that we're in. They're not commissioned services, if you want to call it that. So, so people are able to work with us eh, in a different way because they've got more sustainability around their, their funding in, in terms of eh, eh, what we do. In terms of then some of the ways we've been able to work with the wider, and if I can call them the smaller local partners, it's actually working with the third sector interface and us funding the third sector interface for outcomes and them then being that conduit to fund a lot of the smaller partners eh, in terms of doing that. And it takes away that criticism that many of the smaller partners have about the level of red tape they have to jump through when they're working with statutory bodies. Actually working with you know the sector you know, is one of the things that, that we do. Our, you know, like third sector member on the IGIB is actually our rep on community planning. So it's not one of the officers, it's not one of the health board members, it's not one of the councillors, it's actually the third sector rep that represents us on the community planning a partnership. And clearly it's much wider than just our work around, you know, what we would traditionally think of some of this work in terms of, of health and care. Our violence against women partnerships are heavily supported in terms of the third sector, in fact, led, you know, in terms of the, the, the third sector. Some of the work that we do around community justice in terms of rehabilitation in Kilmarnock Prison, again, you know, Centre Stage and other organisations in the third sector are very much up the, the, the middle of that. The third sector, I don't think, are, you know, like, I don't think they're a parallel service to us. They're integral to the delivery of what we, we do. And we talk about the third sector. I was mentioned before about you know like the you know the um, independent sector, particularly in terms of care homes. And also when you talk about the faith sector, so again, some of the work that we get, you know, in terms of homelessness, some of the work that we do in terms of work around learning disabilities, the support that we get for the faith sector is fantastic. So, so, so that whole community out there, you know, that wider Scottish society that can, you know, support us is, is really important uh, to us. I do think we need to make sure that we, we commission with all these partners appropriately that gives them sustainability. Because actually, you know, that's one of the big dangers of IGIBs don't have early notice in what they're doing in terms of their funds. Then how do you work with you know, third sector partners or other commissioned partners. And, you know, for instance, you know, like partners will come to you say, are we going to be funded in the next financial year? Because some of those say, if not, I'm going to have to set, serve my staff notice at the end of December. You know, and actually then in February say, no, it's OK, funding's OK, so then they need to withdraw the notice. It's no way to continually deliver high-quality services. So, so, so that's a really important area for us that we spoke before. If we've got longer-term funding, then that's what I meant by how the, the relationships with the third sector that we can do better. Very much. We are, we are a little tight for time, so if I can encourage Judith and, and Amari to respond briefly to this question, then we can move on to address set aside, which we need to cover as well. Very briefly, Judith. again, agreeing with Eddie, and I think those those points towards the end, you know, the the procurement of third sector organisations versus the you know our, our our ability to really invest longer term in them, and again, I was going to make the the, the point that you know we, we can't also in in valuing our third sector and um, not forget the role of faith groups in this. Very very important. Important in, in, in communities and what, what they're able to do uh, and our need to invest there and the, the independent private sector, uh, important partners too. And uh, I, I think, yes, we have to think of them as part of the overall continuum of what we're doing in Edinburgh. We're all in this together. And Mary Moy. 
In, in terms of the uh, funding that is available for the third, third sector, we have um, allocated funding uh, to take forward these initiatives. We've tried to protect, protect the third sector organisations from applying savings, but what we've not been able to do is uh, further add to the investment that we've already committed. So th that is a challenge for them, managing any cost pressures that they have within the financial envelope. But it would be our aspiration that we could um, contribute more to them as, as we go forward. In terms of the, um, the third sector, there's also uh, the role of the volunteers. And we've got uh, two um, areas of work, the distress brief intervention, where volunteers who have a lived experience are contributing uh, significantly to the outcomes um, in terms of uh, the, that particular project. And through the alcohol and drug partnership, in terms of the recovery hubs that are um, being set up, again, it's people with lived experience that are actually better placed to assist uh, people at, at a time of crisis in their life and uh, when they're suffering from um, difficulties and challenges. So it is, it's a complex landscape, but it is definitely one that the statutory partners alone um, can't deliver on, and that partnership working with the third sector and the wider community is key. Brian Whittle, a, a, a supplementary inviting very brief answers, Thank I think, um, in this I, case. I, I, I wanted to just uh, very quickly to, to, to uh, tackle the, the issue of implementation of technology. It's not just around, I mean, there's, there's fantastic healthcare technology out there that's not currently being uh, deployed within, within the healthcare sector. It's not just about the purchase of the technology, it's about, the, about deploying that and, and CPD to those on the front line that are going to use it. Within your budgetary re uh, restraints, is, is, that, is that an issue? Judith Proctor. We, we very much want to, to utilise technology as, as, as far as possible, and it isn't always you know, the, the cutting edge stuff. I think there's some basic things that maybe we've, we've, we've not nationally really, really in, in embedded in, um, to, to really support people at home. And I, I was thinking about your, your earlier comment about the thousand um, beds you know, across, uh, across Scotland, and Moira and I uh, were visiting our colleagues in our technology-enabled care service, ATEC24, just last week. Uh, in Edinburgh, which was great just to see the technology that they have, the way that we distribute it across the, the city. But of course, one of the things that we saw when we were there is the sheer number of hospital beds, so those adjustable beds that we have. We have hundreds of those now right the way across the community in people's homes delivering um, sometimes palliative care, sometimes you know really, really complex care there. So we, you know, we're seeing that transfer uh, through the use of equipment as well as, as technology and doing things very, very differently. Um, again, I think there's more that we can be doing which highlights the way that, that uh, the, the technology and uh, adaptations and aids and so on can, can support people. I think we need to highlight that more. Um, I think as we begin to, to work with our training establishments as well and education, higher education, I think we need to prepare um, those students uh, and those new workers coming into our systems to work using the technology more because um, that generation of, of people that are coming in as nurses, doctors, OTs, social workers are far more familiar with technology uh, and far more used to using that. So I think we have to really think about that next generation coming through, the next generation of people that we'll be looking after and, and really being open to testing new, new ways of working. Again, some of that comes down to our, our willingness to invest in that. Um, again, also about the underpinning evaluation. Does it work? Is it as safe? Is it as effective? And Val's point earlier, you know, the individual's experience of that is often far better uh, and we need to be uh, better at communicating that, sharing those good news stories and, 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 and being willing to do things differently. I'll just say that. Convener, um, I think um, uh, likewise I'm going to build on what my colleagues have said. Um, the technology, we've, we're very fortunate in South Lanarkshire to um, be really developing a very strong um, team around our technology, the, the technology enable care, and some of that is around um, the attend anywhere. Um, which is, um, you know, actually being able to do home visits and for occupational therapists to be in the room and for physiotherapists to be somewhere else. Um, so when we're covering a bit of a rural area, fairly, um, you know, where transport can be an issue, that that's really useful. So that's maybe one of them. Um, we do a lot of VC um, um, video um, conferencing um, around our care homes, uh, independent sector and our own care homes. So that can be about connections, but it can be about um, some surgeries. 
Um, and the, the other one is the mobile um, um, monitoring, which I, I mentioned earlier. But uh, So I think we, we are well supported and we have very good connections with the Scottish Government in relation to technology-enabled care. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to scale this up even more in the future. But some of the basic things that Judith has covered, I think we need to make sure that we don't um, forget them because some of the fundamentals... Um, need to be in place as well. And one of the examples I would give would be around home care scheduling, uh, because that's becoming um, really um, complex, but very important in terms of efficiency, effect, and just getting the right person in the right place at the right time. And I'll stop there, because of time, you could go on. Thank you very much. Uh, Eddie Fraser. I suppose that, that I take away from technology able care and look at the support of our staff. So first of all, you can only use tablets, etc., out there and access records if the records are digitised. So one of the things we've had to do over the last year is actually spend significant amounts of money to get all the social work records, first of all, digitised, so you can actually access them. And we've still got a bit of work to do around that in terms of some of the community health records. You know, the secondly then, I think in future, when we talk about employing staff, there should be an element of that that is actually included to make sure that they do have the money there recurrently to, for their tablet, so as it's renewed every three or five years or whatever we need to do that, to make sure there's you know, let's support on hand, that if the tablet doesn't work today, nobody tells you you need to wait a fortnight before you get it fixed because you need it fixed today. So, so actually we need to build the actual basic infrastructure to make sure people can, can access you know, this, you know, range of things there. I think many of us have parts of it. I think if you look across, do we have recurring budgets in that would actually mean that everyone, you know, every one of my 2,000 staff, if they all needed a, a, a tablet or a mobile device, would they all be, have a, a budget sitting there that would renew them every three or five years? Don't know about other colleagues. The answer to me is no. It's almost opportunistic that we actually do some of that type of work. And secondly, we need to invest in the support teams that make sure people are, are supported. So, so I would say that as well as doing the kind of advanced stuff in terms of what we can do and what we can imagine for the future, we need to build the foundations around this as well. And I think the foundations have got a bit of work to be done. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you. I'm interested in um, picking up about the set-aside budget and the... Uh, uh, I know that uh, Val has talked about that, a, a good example of how set-aside was used in South Lanarkshire for the ward that was closed and then care delivered um, in the community. And we've discussed set-aside a lot in this committee previously and how it's operating well in some areas and maybe not so well in others. And, and as a consequence, uh, my issues are, does um, set-aside, if it's not managed well, impede integration and uh, I'm aware that NHS and Friesen Galloway don't even use the language of set aside they, they you know they call it something different so I've got a couple of questions one of them would be could you the panel say um, that the set aside budget is operating as intended um, in your areas and if not what is preventing this and what needs to be changed Judith Proctor um, the situation in Edinburgh is that I think we have very good discussions about the set-aside and I think um, we identified through the self-assessment that we've submitted for the MSG uh, review piece of work that you know we're, we are, we're certainly partly established, moving towards it, established in understanding uh, the position with the set-aside. We get good information and data from NHS Lothian in terms of our, our share. We understand what that means. Um, but, of course, the, the challenge around the use of the set-aside is that it is absolutely um, um, embedded in the delivery of current services. So when we think about the set-aside and conversations that we are having now, we're thinking about services that are currently being delivered with the, the use of those, those resources. Um, I think we all also sometimes fall into the trap of thinking about the set-aside as just as a budget, as money, um, but actually it's about all the resources that that, that that funding is providing. So it is staff, resource, it's expertise, it can be infrastructure costs and so on, and the transfer of that uh, towards the community setting can, can, can then be quite uh, difficult. Um, so I think the 
conversation about set aside is, is complex just by its very nature and by the fact that this is the, the, the wider transformation and move from what we do now to how we might deliver in the future. Uh, and the starting point has to be the transparency of, of the conversation uh, and the, the, the clarity about where responsibility for, for that sits. Uh, so in Edinburgh, we're making certainly good progress in, in understanding the, the the resources where they sit, our responsibilities. I don't think we're there yet and how we as an IGB would commission the use of those resources differently. But where opportunities arise, where we're talking about the potential to change services, we're having that discussion about what does this mean for the potential release of some of that, that, that funding or the transfer of the funding and resources towards a, a, a different model. Uh, so I think we're there in the discussions, but um, it is quite complex. We do have some examples, though, of, of where we have um, managed to use that around about mental health and learning disabilities, where we've transferred the resource in supporting individuals who've lived in, in institutional care and supported them in the community with the resources following them. So that gives us a good blueprint to, 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 to work on uh, uh, around that. So positive discussions, but I don't think we could say that we are um, there yet in terms of our, our ambitions of where we want to go. Eric Fraser. I, I suppose, you know, let's set aside is just almost code for the number of unscheduled care bed nights an IGIB wants to commission off, do you know, the, the acute sector. Do you know, and when you talk about set aside, that then gets down to 10 specialities in particular that is felt that the IGIB is kind of a real, you know, influence over. So in terms of using set aside properly, this is about, so what do we want to commission, you know, from the acute sector this year? And what do we think over the next couple of years will be the direction of travel around that? And that's where that, you know, opportunity within giving directions from an IGIB to a health board, that, that legal term directions to the health board and to the council over the next couple of years is saying, you know, I want to commission 100,000 beds this year. Next year, I think it will be 98,000 beds and next year it will be 96,000 beds. So it's actually then about saying, how do we, you know, let do that and using directions to be able to uh, to do that in terms of, of that. When we actually look at the, the MSG indicators in terms of unscheduled care bed nights, many partnerships across Scotland, and in fact, I think the majority of partnerships across Scotland have actually seen a reduction in the number of unscheduled care bed nights that they actually commission from the, the acute sector. But sometimes the acute hospitals are just as busy. So if you if you operate in a in a board area like Ayrshire and Arran, where more than one IGIB, you know, actually utilises the hospital, then it has to be that all the partners actually reduce the you know the pressure on the hospital before there's any actual release. So there are two different things. There's about the equity of the use of the resource from each of the IGIBs, and then secondly, there's the totality of the resource that goes up and down. Because if all you do is you shift the, you know, like we put some down and north or south, but you know, like more up, then actually there, there is no release from acute. They're still delivering the same level of service. And then similarly, then we need to work together around how we bring uh, that down. I think we're still at quite early stages in terms of the set aside. I agree, you know, with Judith about the understanding where we are. It's ourselves that are working with Scottish Government in terms of saying what would directions look like to be more strategic, you know, over the next year. So we're working with the integration, you know, team of Scottish Government to actually uh, look at that. But I think it's equally important to understand the relationships between IGIBs as well as the relationship between IGIBs and uh, the, the acute sector. Uh, just a, an example of what set aside would mean, for instance, um, anticoagulant therapy monitoring can be done at home. So why are pa patients going to get their blood drawn once a week and all of the associated costs of that when a coagulcheck device can be installed at home that will talk to the GP remotely and tell patients how to fluctuate their warfarin tablets, for instance. So all that can be done remotely. So if funding can be found to support patients using coagulcheck at home, is that a function of set aside? Is that where that money would come from NHS and then move towards community care? Uh, well, this is a... Oh, sorry. Uh, Eddie might give a better answer to this one, but... Um, um, uh, um, uh, yes is probably one, uh, one of the, the direct answer, but it's tricky, it's complex. Um, we were fortunate with the Odston example. One of the other things that we were doing, and I referred to, there wasn't any pathway for this. 
um, when we started to work on this. There's no guidance and no pathway. One of the other things we did with NHS um, Lanarkshire in South Partnership was we, we called it a 5% project. So we basically said, we bet like your example, what's going on in the acute sector in that ward that we could actually try 5% of that in the community? It's like a test of change. And we did that with IV therapies. Um, so we put the staff around, we got a, um, a responsible medical officer to, to overview it, so we put all the clinical safeness and effectiveness in, in place for that, but, but, and, and it's successful, so um, we've taken out something like, there's, I think there's approximately 14 people at any one time in any hospital on IV therapies that could probably be in the community, so we, were, we, were, we had a threshold of two at a time in terms of the scale. Um, if we were to transfer that resource, so it's a successful, we need to know how to scale it up. That's our next challenge. How will we do that? And what will we put around? How can we can we build that in the community? But we're starting on a really sound basis there. We've also done it for COPD, actually, in Clydesdale, which is a really interesting model. But what you're looking at is you're looking at trying to, how can you get the cash released from that? And when you have a ward that has staff, has IT, has a whole lot of other bits of infrastructure that are all really embedded in delivering that ward, and that's only one of the functions on them, it's very difficult to release that cash. In Udston, it was one care of the elderly ward, so it was 30 individuals. There was sort of like a boundary around it, so it was a unit, so we could put a cost on it. But when you're talking about um, the, the very core functions of the acute sector, the delivery is so much wider, so much more complex. It's the infrastructure that need in terms of staff and the, the general infrastructure. It's very difficult to release resource unless you're doing it on big scale. Um, I guess the, with the set aside is normally held within the NHS, does that mean that the NHS owns it or makes it difficult for it to be released? Do they consider it that it's their budget that's being handed out? Barry Murray. To what Val has said, in terms of the approach across Lanarkshire, there's been a very open and transparent approach to the set-aside um, services. There's an unscheduled care group, which is meeting, which has all key stakeholders. From a day-to-day -day, um, basis, it's a director of acute services that manages the services on behalf of the IGIB. But Val and our other colleague, the Chief Officer of North Lanarkshire Council, are very much key partners in terms of taking the uh, set-aside concept forward and transferring and shifting the balance of care. I think I'd like to pick up on, on your earlier observation about what could be impeding the implementation of the set aside, um, as well as the, the role that NHS Lanarkshire has in terms of their transparent approach. In, in terms of what is impeding it, whilst we are trying to move resources and we are trying to shift the balance of care. I think we need to revisit the fundamental underlying assumptions upon which the set aside budget has been based. So from a Lanarkshire context, we know that over the next um, eight years up to 2027, 20, there's going to be an almost 30% increase in the older population. We would actually need to make more beds available to accommodate that increase. We need to make more social care services available as well. But what we would strive to do is, through shifting the balance of care, is manage that demographic growth increase within the financial envelope. It's uh, the underlying assumption that we can release the resources from the acute services to fund that is, in my view, unrealistic and flawed. And I believe that in, in terms of the totality of the whole system and the totality of all the cost pressures, including the new medicines, including the drugs, and recognising that on the acute services, the areas of service that are not within the set-aside budget are also critically important to the people of Scotland, the cancer research, um, outpatient clinics. and th th There's a whole range of services, and it's a whole service system approach that we need to adopt towards that. And it would probably be helpful to revisit the underlying assumptions that, uh, that we're assuming that money can transfer out of acute services to fund the community services. It's probably a, a, an opportune time to revisit that. Interesting point of view. Uh, uh, any, any other 
uh, contributions on that on that theme. Eddie Fraser. You know, like, like, it's almost along that line, you know, like everything around set aside we tend to talk about and equate back to, you know, occupied bed nights. You know, actually changing what we're doing around these specialities impacts not only on bed nights, it impacts on outpatients, it impacts on prescribing, it actually impacts on some of our, you know, primary care services as well. So actually doing positive things in relation to some of the specialities, we can actually see a much wider impact and the focus all the time only on occupied bed nights, I think going forward is maybe not the most helpful you know, focus to have. Okay, now that's very interesting. Emma Harper. Thank you. I'm going to move on to leadership aspects of it because that's came up previously as well. And I'm interested in whether the panel members would agree that leadership challenges exist or have they hampered any progress? Is there any thoughts around how we support and develop people to become leaders? And also, um, I think it was uh, Judith, you talked about supporting staff for change. So it takes good leadership to support staff because a lot of folk don't like change. So what's happening in that area? Judith Proctor. I think this this is a real leadership challenge right the way across, and it's not just for, for chief officers individually or, or us as a group, but I think for all public sector leaders that are involved in this now, because integration to work well involves us all um, working together on um, things that we maybe need to give up um, and things that we need to recognise where the responsibility maybe sits, sits elsewhere. So it's quite a sophisticated level of conversation that we need to have right the way across our, our, our partner organisations, where the accountability sits, where the leadership sits. Um, I do think a big part of this is leading the cultural change that we want to see in our health and social care partnerships. Um, our staff mostly, obviously Highland is a, a, a different partnership set up differently but for, for the majority of the, the 30 other partnerships in Scotland our staff still work to their parent organisation to the NHS terms and conditions of the council uh, terms and conditions however within that I think the leadership for us as chief officers and our, our IGBs is about creating that IGB and health and social care partnership identity what it is that we're trying to do as distinct organisations um, and, and leading our staff towards the outcomes uh, of, of that, that organisation I think that is really really important and, and you're right, it sits beyond us as, as, as chief officers, as our senior teams, and it is about our frontline managers, our, our, our leaders, right the way through our organisations, how they're leading that change, supporting change to, to come forward. And a big part of that, of course, is about creating the conditions in which ideas and different ways of working come from there. So it's not about leadership, which is all about setting direction, and this is what we're doing. It is about how we work together to, 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 to build a movement for change in our, our, our organisations and beyond. Okay. Eddie Fraser. Oh, I, I would think leadership is, is key in, in delivering uh, change, and I think leadership at a number of, of levels. I think leadership in terms of understanding our local communities, so local political leadership, you know, how that's then supported, you know, by the wider partner organisations, including, you know, the, the health board, the local colleges, etc. So, so that leadership around community planning, that real belief in well-being, you know, for our communities, I think is, is key. I also think that the relationship between the chief officer and the two chief executives is key that the trust and relationship there, an open relationship across all three, is one thing I think that is a, is a huge you know, support to actually taking forward, not integration in itself, but actually the outcomes that we try to achieve from integration. If there's a, a high level of trust there in terms of what we're doing, if there's a high level of openness, I think that then is transmitted in terms of what we're doing when we go back into everyday discussions, not just in the IGIB, but in council and at the, at the, the health board. Uh, and I think continually making sure their relationships are strong, that there's an openness there, is, is one of the things that we need to make sure that we continue to, to, to develop from. Okay. And Val de Sousa. Just be um, brief. I mean, I just um, would build on what my colleagues have said. I, I guess what I would um, say is that um, the leadership is key. Um, trust, respect, absolutely key across all the partners. Um, but I think there's two parts to this. It's about, I suppose, leadership with people and leadership with a focus on place. 
So I think we've more or less covered that. So it's about understanding what you're leading, where you're leading, and, and being for your place and for your people is really important. The people part of it is around your workforce. And sometimes when we're um, introducing a, a bit of change, we'll test it out with our 5,000 staff because they live in the area. Um, so they work in the area, they live in the area. So there's a bit about just sort of very fundamental uh, and leadership at all levels. So really important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I know Convener has said that time is tight and I did have a couple of questions around housing because that's really important and uh, it might be that we follow up with questions around housing because Eddie talked about um, vibrant community teams, supported accommodation, how integrated is housing with the IJBs but I'm happy to follow that up at a later point if we need to. If, if witnesses are happy to deal with that and, and, and we may have one or two other things too. Um, then I'll thank you all for your contribution. It's been very informative uh, and we'll suspend briefly uh, and resume in private. Thank you very much. <laughs>